Thank you so much to everyone that's worked so hard on that today. Uh, it is a privilege to be here, isn't it, and witness such a thing. But I'm kind of disappointed in a way because I'm usually looking out for things to go wrong during a nativity because that's what makes it funny sometimes. And you are so brilliant today. You just did everything perfectly. And I'm reminded of the small child that uh, on Christmas Day said to his parents that he wanted to give thanks for the food. And so everybody bowed their head, grandma and grand granddad and everybody around the table, and he began to give thanks. And he started off by giving thanks to, for every friend that he had, literally every single friend. Ten minutes later, he started to thank God for his family, and he named every family member including those around the table. And then finally he came to give thanks for the food and he started to thank God for the turkey and for the potatoes and for the pigs in their blanket and for the gravy and for all those wonderful things that we eat. But then he paused and there was a long quiet and his mum thought, what's going on? And he looked up at his mum and he said to his mum, if I say thank you to God for the sprouts, won't he know that I'm lying? Now, in a few days' time, you'll be opening Christmas crackers, and you'll be getting bad jokes out, and you'll be telling them to each other, and you'll be wanting uh, the, the Christmas jokes to help your day go well. I really do hope that you have a great Christmas day. Also, this time of year, we see these things on our television, don't we? Adverts. The major stores and the department stores show us their Christmas advert for the year. Who can tell me, just shout out, whose advert this is for this year? This Asda, that's right. The store that doesn't price match, but guarantees to be 10% cheaper than anyone else in town. Often think, how do they know? They've never been into my shop, so they can't prove that point, can they? What about this one? Who went downtown this week? to see this lorry. Anybody know what lorry this is? Coca-Cola, that's right. Now imagine a whole van full of Coca-Cola. How many sets of teeth could you dissolve in that? I don't know. You could probably dissolve a car in a, a lorry full of Coca-Cola. What about this next advert? John Lewis, that's right. This year it's backed up, isn't it, by the Lily Allen song. Somewhere only we go. John Lewis, the only department store in town where you know you'll spend more than anywhere else, but at least you can say it comes from John Lewis. <laughs> what about the next one? Oh, everybody's favourite. This is Ant or Deck. I don't know which one's which. I still can't work it out. What uh, supermarket are they advertising? Morrison's, that's right, Ant and Deck, perhaps Newcastle's second greatest export. I say second because Kevin Keegan's got to be number one. Or, or wait, maybe Alan Shearer's number two, and maybe even Cheryl Cole's number three. So they're one of Newcastle's greatest exports. What about this next advert? Who can tell me which this? Sainsbury's, you watch a lot of telly, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> wow. If you go online, you can look at their full-length advert. The TV advert's about three minutes, but the full-length one is 48 minutes long. I really don't advise it. <laughs> Believe me, I've done it. And finally, everybody's favourite. Whose advert is this? Marks and Spencers, that's right. Introducing this year the, new, the Sparkle the Dog. Marks and Spencers. Now, they all have something in common. Every one of these adverts, and believe me, I've watched them all, they all have something in common. There is no mention in any of them of the nativity. There is no image of a, a holy nativity scene. Nothing at all. And somebody has once said that if you take Christ out of Christmas, you will only be left with M and S. They've all forgotten something. Thanks, Dave. But what have they forgotten? Well, Peter said it last week. They have all forgotten that Jesus is the reason for this season. And we as a church have come to celebrate that today, and we will do on Christmas Day, that Jesus is the reason for the season. Apparently, and I don't know who does these polls, because I, and every time somebody comes to me and says, will you just answer a few questions, I normally say no. I'm on my lunch break, I haven't got time. Or when somebody phones up, I just want to carry out a survey, will you do it? So I don't know how they know, but apparently school children were asked 
why we celebrate Christmas and what we're doing when we celebrate Christmas. And 70% of them said it's Father Christmas' birthday. 70%. You see, we've forgotten that Jesus is the reason for this season. Next one, Dave, please. So why do we celebrate on December the 25th? Why do we get together all of our families and friends and we run the risk of a riot? Why do we do that? Well, if you go back in time, it's been done for quite a long time. Yesterday was the winter solstice. And you may have seen on your television the shortest day, and last night was the longest night. Though for some of you it probably wasn't if you were woken up by that thunderstorm last night. Fantastic. I love thunderstorms. But I've got an evangelist friend who was at uh, Stonehenge yesterday, and he was witnessing to some of the people who were there for the winter solstice. Now, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, the Roman Empire used to celebrate on December the 25th the return of the conquering sun. The fact that winter was over and that soon spring would be here. It doesn't feel like that in January and February that winter's over. But from today, the sunlight gets more and more each day, if there is any sunlight. And so they used to celebrate on December the 25th the return of the conquering sun until one of the emperors, uh, emperors Constantine, said, no, that's wrong, we're not going to do that. We are going to celebrate the God's son on December the 25th. And so from that time on, we've celebrated on December the 25th the Lord Jesus Christ's birthday. We have things like this, Christmas trees. Amanda's done a great job at decorating our Christmas tree there. She's also done a great job at making our lounge look ten times bigger. But uh, I watch her do it every year. She spends hours on it, perfecting, putting things in every place. I'm one of those people that gets a bit of tinsel and goes like that around the tree. But we've got a lovely tree here at Lansdowne, haven't we? But why do we have Christmas trees? Well, again, that dates back to the early centuries. In Germany, they used to dress up oak trees, and they used to, uh, again, in a pagan ceremony, they used to uh, worship these trees, until one of the great saints, St. Boniface, said, no, that's wrong, and he cut down the tree, and in its place, we're told, that a little fig tree grew up, an evergreen, grew up in its place, and from that time on in Germany, the Christians used to dress evergreen trees to celebrate the fact that Christ was born at this time of year, or the celebration of it. And they put lights on the trees. Now in those days, the lights were real candles. Now can you imagine if we put a real candle on that tree and lit it, it wouldn't last very long. Today we have electricity, and so we have sparkly candles. But that's to signify as we lit the Advent candle that we're celebrating the light of the world coming. Another thing we have at Christmas is holly and ivy. Quite hard to find these days. But some of us, we've got one, have a wreath on our front doors, made of holly and made of ivy. But why do we do that? Well, if you sing or if you read the words of the carol, the holly and the ivy, you'll begin to realize why. Because the thorns and the holly remind us of the crown of thorns that the Lord Jesus wore. Ultimately, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus, was born to die. It's what we sing at Christmas. And he wore a crown of thorns. And the berries are there to help us remember the blood that he shed, the lifeblood that he gave for us. So lots of these traditions we have at Christmas time, and perhaps we've forgotten as a country, even as a world, why we do it. We're here to celebrate someone's important birthday, the day that the Lord Jesus came and was born a man. Other things we celebrate at Christmas, like parcels and things like that, we've forgotten why they were, but we haven't got time to go into that. I would like to suggest to you that we have forgotten why we celebrate Christmas in our country. But has it always been like that? I want to show you a Bible text next. This is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. While they were there, it says, that's Bethlehem, The time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. You see, when Jesus was born, there was no room for him 
in the society. Next one, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2. The story is that the, the, uh, the magi, or the free, the kings, or the wise men, as we call them sometimes, have come to Herod. They've said, we've come to celebrate the birth of the new king. Where is he? And uh, Herod is scared by this. Herod is worried. And so he says to them, tell me where he is, and I'll go and worship him. But he meant to kill him. And so we read this, when Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. And then finally in John's Gospel, another Bible text for today. This is John speaking about the coming of the Word, or the Lord Jesus, being made flesh, being made a man. We read these words. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. You see, it's not new that we forget about the one person in the Christmas story that we should be celebrating. The world, over the next few days, will party will have fun, will have a great time with some of their friends. But I wonder if they'll be celebrating the most important reason for Christmas. Someone has written this, a tongue twister about those kings. And uh, I like it, but it's hard to read, so I'm going to read it to you. Three kings came to see the king and asked him where the new king was born. But the first king told the three kings that he didn't know where the second king was. His advisors looked in the Bible, though not in one and two kings. They found out that the second king was to be born in Bethlehem. So the king told the three kings to find the second king and tell him the first king where the second king was. The first king thought the second king was one king too many. But when the three kings found the second king, they realized he was actually the number one king, the king of kings. And that compared to him, all other kings were really no kings at all. So why did Israel and Herod and Bethlehem not really remember or see the birth of the Lord Jesus? I'd like to suggest this as we get to near the end. Why is Jesus often left out of the Christmas story? First thing, Bethlehem was too busy. Bethlehem was far too busy, and we know what that's like, don't we? I've still got to work up to Christmas Eve, and I'm sure some of you have, and we're just going to be so busy that I don't know when I'm going to get to deliver the parcels to my family. I don't know when I'm going to get to buy some food to, uh, for, to, to cook on Boxing Day, because uh, I'm so busy. Bethlehem, they'd taken part in a census, which meant that people had come for miles to register so that they, the authorities knew whether they owed taxes or not. And they were so busy, and they were so tired that when a company of angels came and said, glory to God in the highest, they didn't even notice. I wonder if I'm like that at Christmas. I wonder if I'm just too busy to include Jesus. Herod, he was scared. Next one, Dave. He was too scared. He thought this king was going to come and take his palace. He thought that this baby being born, according to scriptures, was going to come and take his place. And Herod was just too scared to include Jesus. And so he, he, he tried to kill him and he put him to one side. Now there are people out there, maybe you're one of them, I don't know. And when it comes to talking about Christianity, and when it comes to mentioning the Lord Jesus and why he came, you're scared. You don't want to know. But that, that, that's for religious people. It's not for me. Maybe you know what he might demand of you to give your life to him. And so you're scared, and you don't want to follow him. Final group of people, the whole of Israel, we read that they didn't recognize him. I think they were confused. They'd been waiting for this Messiah to come, and in their mind, he was a warrior. He was going to rid them of the Romans, and he was going to set them free. So when God sent the Lamb of God, they didn't recognize him. They didn't know what to do with him. And when Jesus started to heal the sick, and make the blind see. They were conflicted. They were confused. They didn't know what to do with Jesus. You see, they thought that God would send uh, 
someone to help them out of their greatest need. They thought they would send a warrior king. They thought that God was going to send him. You see, the problem they had is that they didn't know what their greatest need was. And I wonder if I asked you the same question today. If God could give you anything, and he can, what would you ask of God? What is your greatest need? Somebody has written these things. Next ones, please, Dave. Why did Jesus come? What is man and women and boys and girls' greatest need? Someone has said this. If our greatest need had been for information, God would have sent us an educator. Someone else has said this. If our greatest need was for technology, and I know some of you men especially like your gadgets. I'm a Luddite when it comes to things like that. I don't know how to work my phone. But if our greatest need was technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need was for money... God would have sent us an economist. Now you notice there how he doesn't say a banker. God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need as human beings was for pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But the Bible tells us this. Our greatest need is for forgiveness. And so God had to send us a saviour. Friends, you and I, our greatest need in the world today is that we experience God's forgiveness. When you children go to a party, or when you go on Christmas Day to your grandparents, and you dress up nice, and, or you're going to a relative's house, your parents will say to you this, you remember to be good. You remember to say your please and thank you. You don't have to, parents, do you? Say to them, now you remember to be bad. You remember to be rude. Because it's our natural way to be rude. It's our natural way to not be good. Bible tells us that. It tells us that we've all fallen short of the standard that God set. And so our greatest need, and it's the message that the angels brought that day, when they said, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and goodwill to all men. Our greatest need is that we experience forgiveness. That we experience forgiveness. Goodwill on whom his favour rests. What does that mean? If we accept God's forgiveness, then we are in our, that state of being forgiven, of experiencing God's goodwill. Friends, I said at the start, and I'll say it again, God's greatest desire, God's passion for you and me, is that we might know him, and that we might come to him. Now, I'm filthy. I've had a shower today, but rather like my hair, I have a shower every day, if not twice a day, and I wash it. I then open up this pot, and it's called wax, and I put my fingers in it, and I rub my hair like that, and I make it dirty again. Every day, we wake up and we try and do the right thing, but every day we just get, we just get dirty. We tell a lie. We hurt someone. We're unkind. We're dishonest. Our greatest need at Christmas is for forgiveness. And so why don't you receive the greatest gift of all time? The gift that God sent. The gift of his son. Now every year for the last, since I've been an adult, so maybe for the last 10 years, no, maybe 25 years, I have received one gift that is the same every single year. I've got an auntie called Auntie Joy. She's not here today, is she? No, good. Uh, I've got an auntie called Auntie Joy. And she has sent me every year for the last 25 years the same present. There's two things in it always. There's some soap or some shower gel. And there's a pair of socks or a pair of underpants. What more can a man need? You need to clean and you need appropriate undergarments, don't you? So every year she sends me the two. Shower gel and socks. Now I know what's in that parcel. I don't need to open it to know what's inside it. But if I left it underneath my Christmas tree, it would do me no good. Even though I know what's in there. Now you might think that you know what Christmas is all about. You've heard the songs, you've sung the carols, you've, you've heard a, a, a talk. And you might say, look, I know what Christmas is about, so I can just leave it there. Friends, if you leave the gift that God has given you unwrapped, it will do you no good. This Christmas, 
perhaps for the first time, we need to accept God's gift of His Son, that love gift, that passion that God has for us. We need to take it, and we need to open it, and we need to ask the Lord Jesus to come and remedy our greatest need, the need for forgiveness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask this morning that we might begin to understand the reason that you sent your Son into this world. Heavenly Father, it wasn't so that we could have a great party, though we thank you for all the good gifts you give us and the pleasure that we can have in each other's company. It wasn't, Heavenly Father, so that we might look right. Though, Heavenly Father, we thank you for our daily bread and for the clothes that we wear and the the homes that you've given us. It wasn't so we could be proud of who we are. But Heavenly Father, you sent your Son because our greatest need is to have your forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we want to know you and we want to be in your presence one day. But Heavenly Father, we know that you are a holy God. And so we thank you that you sent your Son to die in our place upon that cross. Help us, Heavenly Father, every person that is here today to accept that gift that you have given Help us not to leave the Lord Jesus out of our celebrations over the next few days. Help us to witness to our friends and our families and tell out that good news that the angels had, that there is peace available with you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you take these mumbled words that we have heard this morning and present them to our hearts as a, a, an audible and a, something that we will recognize as to the reason that you sent your Son. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us so much. Be with us now in our last carol and in our time of uh, fellowship together afterwards. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.